to have this evening, Mr. Rajat Nag. Um, he's one of us because he's an alumni of the London School of Economics. He has been with the Asian Development Bank for over two decades and in the position as the Managing Director General since 2006. His crucial role, he plays a very important role in providing strategic and operational direction for the ADB and he's been doing this since 2006. Um, he's, he's also, um, he, as you know, the Asian Development Bank is uh, leading, has been play, playing a very important role in Asia's development. And this evening, he'll be talking to us about Asia's challenges, ensuring inclusive and green growth, which is of importance um, for many countries in Asia right now. Um, we will be recording this lecture and um, we hope that it would be provided online as a um, podcast and video recording. So I request you to, to keep your phones on silent so that it doesn't clash with the recording. Um, also, the Twitter hashtag is hash LSE um, NAG, N -A -G, so that's your Twitter hashtag. So, um, please keep your phones on silent and the, the running order today would be Ms. Nag would be speaking for about 45 minutes and then we'll open it to the floor for questions. And with that, I pass it on to Ms. Nag. Thank you. Can I dismantle this a bit? Thank you very much, Ruth, for the warm welcome, and thank you all for coming uh, this evening. <coughs> Delighted to be here. Uh, as Ruth mentioned, uh, my wife and I, who actually happens to be in the audience as well, <laughs> uh, we both were here uh, before many of you were born. Uh, and many, much, much has changed, but what I was delighted to see is the right spot hasn't. So there's some, some sense of continuity. Uh, and uh, of course, it's always a pleasure to come back and speak to the future of this world, of course, which you are. So I'll talk about a topic which is uh, very dear to my heart, uh, which is Asia, a region which, of course, you all know very well. And I'll talk about the challenges it faces and also the potential. Uh, Saruth, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, delighted to be here. Uh, LSE's founders, of course, as you know, had this vision uh, of a better society. And I think that still remains an important vision for all of us. Uh, and certainly in Asia, we have uh, many concerns about what is not yet a society which takes care of its people, takes care of its environment, though it has done many good things. I want to talk a bit about, about those challenges. Uh, let me talk a bit about Asia first in the context of the world economy. And uh, many people, uh, and I'm sure you've heard this, talk about emergence of Asia. Uh, Asia is now sort of you know, up there on the global scene. And I like to remind ourselves that in a sense, it's not so much emergence of Asia as a re-emergence of Asia. Uh, in about 1700, uh, Asia accounted for about two-thirds of the world's total uh, output. Uh, between 1700 and 1950, Asia gradually lost its importance. There was the Industrial Revolution. The West accelerated its growth. And in the 19th century alone, Asia's share of the global economy fell well below a third, uh, actually 28% by 1900, and really reached its bottom by 1950, when it was about one-fifth, about 19%. So very steady <coughs> decline, and it has really start, started to emerge, and now it's about 28%, 27%. Uh, so, Putting it in a historical perspective, it's not quite that you know Asia has emerged and taken place in the center. We're getting there, but certainly not there yet. 
Uh, this reemergence, of course, as you know, was led by Japan in uh, beginning in the 50s, uh, which really was a very remarkable achievement. Uh, per capita income in Japan doubled in one decade, 56 to 65. Uh, of course, and then Korea, Taipei, China, Singapore, uh, and then later the ASEAN countries joined in. Uh, China joined the party in early 1980s, and then India in the early, late 80s, early 90s, principally after the reforms in 1991. So it's been a remarkable uh, growth, and today if you include, I said 27, 28%, that 27, 28% is what we call developing Asia, which is Asia, X, Japan, Australia, New Zealand. If you include those three, then uh, Asia accounts for about one third, uh, slightly over one third, or 35 percent. And of course, this economic transformation has brought tremendous benefits to its people. In 1990, uh, more than half of developing Asia's population lived on less than one dollar twenty-five cents a day, which is the poverty level. Uh, Twenty years later, uh, that proportion had declined to less than one quarter, which is, if you come to think of it, in less than 20 years, a proportion of half of people living below $1.25 had come down to one in quarter, which is a remarkable, remarkable achievement. Uh, and therefore, this region's dramatic rise has often led people in Asia, in moments of exuberance and euphoria, to say, the Asian century is here, and here we are, we have <coughs> made it. I feel that the Asian century, and that's the case that we'll be making, is plausible, but not preordained. I think that's a very important element to remember. You cannot just extrapolate the past, what has happened in the last couple of decades in Asia, remarkable uh, as it is and just expect that to continue into the future. There are quite a few road bumps ahead. And therefore, last year, we at the ADB decided we better look at the facts and do some work to see is the Asian century really on us or can happen? And if so, what are the challenges that Asia faces? Uh, two scenarios emerged, uh, one, which is, uh, I would say, a more optimistic scenario. Uh, we call it the Asian century scenario. Uh, and that basically is a scenario which sees an affluent Asian in generation. Uh, by 2050, it will be an Asia that could produce more than half of the global GDP, 52% to be precise. And as you reckon, as you realize, that was about the same level that we had in 1700s. Uh, and an Asia where the per capita income could be about $40,000 a year, and people in Asia in 2050 could enjoy a standard of living that Europeans enjoy today. Now, that's the so-called Asian century. That's the Asian century scenario, as I said, an optimistic one. The other scenario, which is certainly much less rosy, uh, looks at a scenario where countries get caught in what is called a middle-income trap. A uh, middle-income trap, as you know, is basically countries grow for a while and then plateau out <coughs> when they reach a per capita income of about twelve, thirteen, fifteen thousand dollars And at that point, they can't compete with countries above them because those countries are highly skilled and the countries caught in the middle income trap can't keep up with, with that high technology requirements. And they can't compete with countries below them because those are the low cost countries and the wages are lower and therefore they can make the shoes and the clothes, etc. So countries get caught in the middle income trap and the world is full of examples of this having happened uh, in Latin America, Brazil is an example. In, the, in Asia, the country I live in now, Philippines is another example. Uh, but of course there are countries which didn't get caught in the middle income trap. Korea is a, plot, you know, a prime example of that. So if 
Asia gets caught in the middle income trap, then uh, obviously the future is much less bright and our estimates are that per capita incomes, instead of being $40,000, could be only as much as $20,000, half of what the Asian century scenario is. And the proportion of global GDP, <laughs> instead of being 52% under the Asian century scenario, would be down to about 33, 34%. And this middle income trap scenario is not as pessimistic as one would think, uh, considering what's happening in the world today after the global economic slowdown, China's growth uh, moderated from the this, uh, dizzying 10% uh, plus we'd seen for the last you know, 20, 30 years, now to a more manageable, more sustainable 7, 8% India's growth rate again, which was uh, dazzling at about 8, 9% for the last several years, now down to between five to six, maybe it'll go up a bit. But the point is that the growth rates are moderating, uh, and therefore, the Asian century scenario where everything is good and $40,000 per capita emergence uh, is plausible, is still plausible, but not preordained. Now, our study looked at several factors which could cause Asia to stall uh, several issues. Uh, I'll just focus on two, uh, because I think those two have to be addressed now. And if Asia fails to address those challenges, uh, I think it's more likely that we'll get caught in the middle income trap rather than moving to the Asian century scenario. And these two challenges are essentially one of rising inequality and two of worsening environment. So Asia faces many challenges, and I'll allude to some of them, but the principal ones, I feel, is the need to have inclusive growth and green growth. And that is what my topic today is, Asia's challenges ensuring equitable, inclusive growth. So let me talk first about the inclusive growth part. Uh, We've all heard about the uh, glitzy towers of Shanghai and Mumbai and uh, Jakarta or Manila, what have you. You've all heard of the uh, dazzling stories of Asia's successes. <coughs> but those of you who are from Asia, and many of you, and most of you, I'm sure, have visited Asia, have also seen <coughs> side by side some of the worst slums in the world. You would have seen that while India boasts the largest number of billionaires created in the last five years after Russia, the fact is that about 700 million people in Asia do not have access to clean water. And 1.7, 1.8 billion people do not have access to improved sanitation. 20 million children in developing Asia were not enrolled in primary schools. And this is again in a region which has some of the world's best universities. And I know that many of the students here from Asia have come from there. Uh, three million children in Asia die uh, before the age of five. And 83 million, slightly over 80 million children are underweight at the age of five. And it's this last statistic I want you to focus on for a moment. 83 million children under the age of five underweight. That means that these 83 million individuals have essentially already doomed for life because their intellectual growth and their physical growth are both going to be stunted. So, you have a situation of an Asia which we call, and which you have heard, I'm sure, the two faces of Asia, one shining and the one not so shining. And the challenge is that these two faces are diverging rather than converging. And I feel, I believe, that this is a major challenge, probably the most pressing challenge for Asia today. 
Now, this reality of diverging uh, Asia is in stark uh, contrast to the growth with equity story which Asia actually went through uh, during the 60s and the 70s. You know, you had Japan, you had Korea. The, the growth happened, uh, some divergence on the equity, but then it started to converge. But today, uh, between uh, 1990 <coughs> and late 2010, the Gini coefficients in almost all countries in Asia have actually diverged. Very few exceptions, uh, Thailand and Malaysia actually. Other than that, uh, China, it worsened from 32.4% to 43.4%. Uh, India's uh, went, uh, in, as you know, Gini coefficient, high the Gini coefficient was the uh, inequality uh, from 32.5% to 37%, Bangladesh 27.6 to 32.1. You name it, all countries, those which did have a very significant growth story uh, had very significant rises, uh, increases in inequality. Now it's ironic actually that the <laughs> very factors that have driven Asia's growth, i.e. technological change, globalization, and market-oriented reforms, are also the same ones which have driven inequality. We, we know, for example, that coastal areas and cities <coughs> benefit most from economic expansion, while the interiors of a country like China is a classic example, the growth that happened in the coastal areas of China uh, saw tremendous improvement in their per capita incomes, and the interior of the country, the western part of the country did not. Uh, of course, we also know that skilled labor and owners of capital reap a much larger share of the gains in the initial stages of economic expansion. The IT boom in India uh, basically meant that those who were skilled and could participate in that growth process, which was boomed by the IT, saw their incomes increasing very, very significantly. But it didn't create the employment in the agriculture sector, or the informal sector, and certainly the wages there stagnated. Now, if this process was only for a relatively short period, you would expect that uh, classic Kuznets curve, you would expect that in inequality increase, but what is happening in Asia is that we are not seeing really that inverted U. As a matter of fact, some argue that you're almost seeing an italicized N curve. So you see it coming down, but then it's up again. And, and I think uh, Asia is in that uptick of the N, and certainly a cause for great concern. <laughs> now, I think this rising inequality, which uh, is obviously accompanied by visible, very visible uh, changes in consumption patterns and lifestyles, uh, could lead to political tensions, could lead to undermining of the social cohesiveness, something that I think we should be all worried about, uh, which is, I think, a very troubling prospect in an already <coughs> tumultuous world. And also, certainly for the young minds here, it should be an ethical question as well. Is it ethical that with all the growth that we are seeing, there's also this rising inequality? Is it ethical to have the two faces of Asia diverging? Is it ethical to have the glitzy towers in Mumbai almost next door to those of you who are from Mumbai would know the largest slums in the world? But if I leave aside the ethical questions for a moment, I personally think we should not, but even if we leave it aside, there is a very important economic reason that I think we should be very concerned about inequality. And that is that inequality actually hampers poverty reduction. The same amount of growth which would cause poverty to come down, because poverty, uh, economic growth is the best antidote for poverty. The poverty-reducing impact of growth is attenuated by 
inequality. Uh, for example, uh, in Nepal, in Indonesia, in Bangladesh, in Cambodia, where we've done these studies, the, if the economic growth rate over the period 1993 to 2005 had remained what actually happened, but the income distribution did not worsen, which unfortunately it did, but if it had not worsened, the poverty levels in each of these countries would have been significantly lower, in some cases almost halved. And the reason is that the impact of, po impact of growth on reducing poverty gets attenuated if the income distribution, if the initial conditions are not more egalitarian. And inequality, of course, can affect growth itself. Uh, it leads to misallocation of human capital, it hollows out the middle class, and it constrains the development of institutions and policies needed to sustain growth over the long term. So I think rising inequality is something Asia has to contend and contend very, very rapidly. Uh, how, how should be that be done? Again, uh, several choices, but let's, before I get into that, just spend a moment in talking about two types of inequality. I think it's important to distinguish between inequality of opportunity and inequality of outcome. We are concerned about inequality of opportunity. That's the bad inequality. The outcome is as a result of efforts or result of some innate abilities. You study hard, you burn the midnight oil, you get an A, somebody doesn't get a D. That's not inequality. <laughs> that's just the outcome of efforts. And that's okay, that's great actually. But it's the inequality of opportunity, of the access to opportunity, of access to education, access to health, because of circumstances of your birth, or because of your ethnicity, because of your gender, this, those inequalities that we're talking about. So in Asia, when we're talking about addressing inequality, is this bad inequality that we're talking about. So we're talking about how to equalize access to opportunities. I see the three essential pillars uh, of an effective, inclusive growth strategy. First, which is very obvious, high and efficient economic growth. You, you have to have growth. You can't, you're not talking about a redistribution of the pie, so the pie has to grow. So we'll have to look at how the economic growth will be sustained. Uh, in Asia, for example, developing Asia, 500 million people are unemployed and 15 to 20 million people join the labor force each year. So how would you provide employment opportunities? So high growth, which also has to be job creating. The second pillar is social inclusion, uh, which means that people who are excluded from economic opportunities created by economic growth are brought into that process so that people have access to opportunity, through investments, public investments in education, public investment in health. You cannot participate in the growth process if you're not skilled, and you cannot participate in the growth process if you're not well. And the third pillar really would consist of social safety nets, which would mitigate the risks and vulnerabilities associated with economic shocks. So you'd have to have some sort of a pension system, you'd have to have some sort of unemployment insurance. These are Actually, before we think it's unaffordable in Asia, I should mention they're actually being done. Limited, but in China, in India, there are now forms of unemployment insurance through a scheme called NREGA, uh, the National Rural Employment Guarantee Act in India. There is a rural health insurance scheme in China. Beginning to happen, but uh, I think it's very important that social safety nets be in place. So these three pillars, High growth, social inclusion, and social safety nets are critical. And they must be grounded in good governance. I think that is absolutely the encompassing fabric of these. And when I say good governance, I don't mean just corruption. Corruption is very, very critical to fight. It's a tax on the poor. It's a cancer on society. But it is not enough. We've got to talk about institutions. We've got to talk about rule of law. We've got to make sure that the dispute resolution mechanisms are in place so that the inclusive growth can actually take place. In this context, I find it very useful to 
draw on two Sanskrit words, which I'm sure you're familiar with, and something that Professor Amartya Sen has popularized quite a bit. And the two words, Sanskrit words, are actually very simple. One is called niti, N-I-T-I. Niti and the other one is nyai, N-Y-A-Y-A. Both of them more or less translated into justice. But there's a very fundamental difference. Niti refers to organizational propriety. It refers to institutions. It refers to the laws and rules and regulations, which are very important. But nyai refers to justice as we know it. Uh, nyai recognize the rule of niti. You need to have rules and organizations, but considers the world as is. And the point here is that in Asia, indeed in many places, we get sometimes so carried away getting the next rule done or next law on the books that people don't look at the implementation of the laws. So there's not good enough to have the laws which ban dowry which we have had in India since 1961, but the implementation of that law. And to recognize that bride burning is a terribly <coughs> unacceptable social phenomenon of a total denial of justice. So when we're talking about inequality, I want you to think not of some perfect world, but the world as is. And as Professor Sain says in his book, uh, which I'm sure again you know, Development as Freedom, he says, and I quote, the greatest relevance of ideas of justice lies in the identification of patent injustice on which reasoned agreement is possible. I think reasoned agreement is possible that a girl child who has to work for seven hours to fetch a pail of water is patently unjust. So even if there is a law which says every girl child must go to school and you don't have enough access to water and the girl has to walk seven hours, there has been a violation of fundamental justice. So when we talk about inclusive growth, I want you to also think of justice and not in a perfect world. Partial ordering, you all, all are very familiar with that. You don't have to have all the states of the order ranked. But you know that a situation of the girl child having to walk for seven hours is a violation and therefore something has to be done about some of those, those activities. And let me leave another Sanskrit word for you to mull on and that's called matsamaya. That's a bit more complicated. Matsa means fish. It is basically the justice in the world of fish in which the big fish eat up the small ones. We don't want that. We don't want a matza nea. We want nea, we want justice. And inclusive growth has to recognize this whole emphasis on justice. Institutions are important, beauty <coughs> is important, but justice even more so. So that's about inclusive growth. Uh, let me turn to the other one, which I think is equally important, and that's the environmental sustainability or green growth. And the reason I want to speak about it is for decades now in Asia, <coughs> and sometimes understandably, we have taken the view, grow now, clean up later. And I think our point is that that growth paradigm is simply untenable. It has wreaked havoc on the environment, and put lives and livelihoods at serious risk. Now, I've told you about the growth story of Asia, and you all sort of are familiar with it. Per capita incomes have grown tremendously. We now sort of account for 28% of the global GDP, et cetera, et cetera. But at the same time, over the last four decades, about 40% of Asia's coral reefs have vanished. China has lost 70% of its mangrove forests in the past 50 years. And Southeast Asia has lost 13% of its forest area, an area roughly the size of Vietnam. Air pollution in Asian major cities is associated with more than half a million deaths a year. And highly polluted rivers, Inadequate water and sanitation, agriculture and industrial pollution contribute to freshwater scarcity, poor health and deaths. And in terms of the number of people, we 
are the most severely affected continent for desertification and drought. Land degradation has created economic, environmental, and social hardship for millions of poor subsistence farmers. You, you know this story. And it's a story that I don't think we can ignore. Our rivers have become, most of the time, sewer pipes. And though I do take some comfort when I come to London, when people, when I admire the beauty of the Thames, I'm living on the, on the Thames this time, and I'm told this was not this clean and good a few decades back. I have some comfort, but I worry that we may not have time in Asia to take stock of the terrible situation on our environment. And of course, and some would say as a consequence of our growth story, we are vulnerable to many types of disasters, uh, floods, cyclones, earthquakes, droughts, and during the past decade, on average, more than 200 million people were affected and more than 70,000 people killed by natural disasters annually. And that is roughly 90% of the world total on the people affected and 65% of the world's total by deaths. Now, the reason I mention these is because sometimes we feel in Asia at least, well, okay, these are inevitable parts of growth, that's what happened in the rest of the world, we will have to bear the consequences later. My point is, we can't wait. Uh, Asia now, uh, China now is the largest greenhouse gas emitter, India is fast catching up. Since 1990, developing Asia's share in worldwide energy-related CO2 emissions has more than doubled. And if we don't do something about it, this share will rise to nearly half the total global by 2030, which is less than 18 years away. So the environmentally unsustainable path of growth is also incompatible with the pursuit of inclusive growth. And I believe that environmental damages are reaching a scale at which our growth story itself is getting vulnerable. And is the poor who bear the brunt the most. Because sometimes we grow, or we say we grow, to reduce poverty, which basically means to help the poor. The environmental damages hurt the poor the most. So whenever you have a typhoon or any such natural disasters, just look at the people who are displaced. Somehow, the rich always seem to have a house at the hilltop. And it's always the poor who get washed away, the ones, the ones who bear the brunt. Now, we are coming around to taking the view that it has to be growth, environmentally sustainable, green growth has to be a simultaneous process. You have to grow, but it has to grow green. And there are, of course, costs. There are huge costs of greening. There are huge costs that we have to uh, accept. But the benefits of those are huge as well. And the costs of not doing it equally huge. Some estimates, and it doesn't really matter whether these are out by even some orders of magnitudes, but I think they're in the right ballpark. Uh, more than half the measures needed to move developing economies in Asia to a non-carbon fuel growth would eventually pay for themselves with the residual cost amounting to about 140 to 170 billion dollars annually by 2030. Now, quite rightly, people will say, where is this 140 to 175 billion dollars annually to come from? I would just say that contrast this with the estimated one trillion dollars or more each year that currently goes into subsidies for fuel. And we have to recognize, at the same time though, that there is incidence of cost. I am concerned, and I think this is an issue for, for all of you to ponder about, whether the costs of green growth are borne asymmetrically by the poor. 
Uh, this is an issue which I think we have said green growth is good, and I believe, I think we all believe it is. I think green growth has to be part of a growth story. You cannot have sustainable growth if it's not green. But I think there is more work that needs to be done on the incidence of the cost of greening, particularly on the poor, for whom, both as consumers and producers, you might see their terms of trade being disadvantaged. As consumers, they might have to pay more for goods which have internalized the cost of the externalities of uh, pollution. As producers, because their major resource which they're selling on the market is labor, if green growth makes production more capital intensive, then does it affect the labor uh, that, is, that they can make available? But overall, I believe that that is a matter of how you adjust at a policy level how to compensate the poor. It is not an argument for not having the green growth. I think that's very, very important for us to recognize in Asia. Sometimes I feel, and I'm sure you do too, that the world is stuck in an ideological debate about reducing carbon emissions. We know that Asia is the <coughs> fastest growing uh, region, reducing greenhouse gas emissions. We also know that Asia didn't cause it. Asia's recent uh, phenomenon of growth the stock of the greenhouse gas emissions in the atmosphere came from the industrialized world. And therefore, this whole debate of stock versus flow, absolute versus per capita, gets into the debate, understandable, but quite frankly, unhelpful. Because the facts are that neither the developing countries alone, nor the developed countries alone, can prevent the worst effects of climate change. In a study that uh, was done uh, recently by actually some scholars who are now with the LSE, uh, some very interesting scenarios. Under a business as usual scenario, in which basically nobody does anything and hopes for the best and keeps growing uh, on this unsustainable path, by the year 2100, the average global temperature will rise by 4.9 degrees, which is sort of you know, almost disastrous. Now, if only the developed countries were to take action, the so-called Annex I countries by Kyoto Protocol, and they were to reduce their emissions by 80% from the 1990 levels by 2050, which I think is going to be difficult, if not impossible. But even if the Annex I countries did this, the simulation shows that the drop in the temperature, global temperature, would go down from 4.9 degrees increase to 4.4 degrees. Some decline, but not significant to make much difference. However, if the developing countries of the world, and these are called the GEMS, the global, the, uh, uh, the global emerging markets, the, sorry, the G20 emerging markets, which is Argentina, Brazil, China, India, Indonesia, Korea, Mexico, South Africa, and Turkey, with this group, if they also took action, and they were to restrain their emissions to the 2005 levels by uh, 2050 and reduced emissions from deforestation by 50%, then, if the developed countries did their bit, developing countries did their bit, then the average global temperature rise could be limited to 2.7 degrees. Not insignificant, but considerably lower than the 4.9 degrees. The message being, that it can't be one or the other, it has to be both sides, the developed countries and the developing countries, to contain the global warming. And we really don't have any choice. A business as usual scenario is a doomsday scenario for everybody. Particularly for Asia, under a business as usual scenario, the sea levels would rise by about 46 centimeters by the end of the century. And if that were to happen, 15 of the 20 worst affected cities would be in Asia. So my point is to the Asian policymakers, to us, is that we need to take these actions for our sake. 15 of the 20 cities which be submerged will be in Asia. And therefore, uh, 
the, the consequences are obvious and the actions are apparent. And of course, uh, the region would be further hurt. This is just submerging. The region would obviously be further hurt through significantly lower crop yields, decreased GDP growth, and health and other social impacts. Just for Southeast Asia, for example, just to give you a sense, and similar factors, similar figures would apply, I'm sure, for other regions. Just for Southeast Asia, under a business as usual approach, the GDP decline, GDP cost, would be about 6.4% each year by 2100. I mean, that's a 6.4% loss of GDP because of climate change. Now, I think it's fair to say that Asia recognizes these, uh, these challenges. And many countries are already taking action. China, for example, uh, has already become a world leader in wind power and the adoption of electric automobile and high-speed rail transport. In 2011, for example, China had 2,200 megawatts of newly installed solar photovoltaic cells and 18,000 megawatts of newly installed wind capacity. India similarly, uh, much lower levels, but similarly uh, has seen significant growth both in solar and in wind. Uh, nearly every country in Asia now has a uh, no national climate change strategy. Uh, they have taken steps to undertake both adaptation and mitigation. Uh, they have taken the preliminary steps of making risk assessments for their people, but <coughs> consequences of natural disasters. Uh, and the consciousness, and we're discussing this just before this, this talk, that in Asia, I don't think we have to now convince people of the problems at hand. But I think what we have to convince ourselves is of the actions to be taken. And if Asia is going to be the leader in the world accounting for 52% of global GDP by 2050, which is less than 40 years away, the point is that Asia then also has to be at the global table, taking steps of its own, cannot take the view that it's somebody else's problem, we will grow and we'll clean later. We will grow now, we'll take care of the inequality later. So, many problems in Asia. Uh, urbanization, the financial sector, good governance, and I haven't got into those uh, in detail. But I think the most fundamental challenges for Asia are the rising inequality and therefore the need for inclusive growth, the need for environmental management, hence the need for green growth. They have to be simultaneous. It cannot be do something now, grow now, take care of equality later, grow now, take care of the environment later. But once we do, that is, we sustain inclusiveness, we, we bring in inclusiveness, we bring in a green growth, I believe that Asia can indeed fulfill what I think is probably its destiny, which is to sort of you know, be a much better place in both in quality and quantity of life much better place where poverty has been reduced, if not eliminated, hopefully eliminated. And I will certainly look to you youngsters to make sure that we all are up to the task. With that, I thank you very much. Thank you for the talk. My name is Lisa Pretorius. I just wanted to ask what sort of policies are currently in discussion in terms of um, looking at the costs of green growth so that, number one, they don't stand in the way of green growth, and number two, to compensate the poor if it does fall on you. Thank you for your talk. Um, my name is Spencer Xiao, and I'm an economic student. So, oh, sorry, okay. Uh, here, here, here at LSE. And so you talk about a good governance, but the problem is that if the policy makers, they become a base of interest, and they itself become the obstacles to reform, then how are we going to fight corruption and how are we going to provide good governance? Thank you. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much for, <clears throat> for, your, for, for your, all this information. Uh, my name is Geoffrey Dolphin, I'm a student uh, at LSE. Um, you um, talked about the importance of social cohesion um, for future development path and I was wondering how in countries like India 
um, social cohesion might be strengthened uh, or achieved um, given the fact that um, as such it might be a well, fairly stratified um, society. Thank you. Thanks. Shall we take these three minutes and uh, yeah. let me then go in the reverse order. Uh, I think uh, the issues of social cohesion in India, and of course this can apply to other countries as well, ultimately gets down to two points, I think. One is good governance, and one is a concept of fairness. I think if people believe that they have a fair shot at the opportunity, not in the outcome, I don't think people are sort of so naive as to expect equal outcomes, but so long as they feel that they have a good shot at the opportunity, it would help build some more social cohesion. Uh, therefore, public investments in education, public investments in health in India, and Regan that I mentioned, has done, it's not perfect, it's not a perfect scheme at all, but it has made a big difference because the rural people now feel that they have a guaranteed right to work, not a benefit, it's not a welfare which is sort of you know, coming down, it's a right to work. They don't have to move away from their land just to be able to earn a basic minimum living. If they see the leaders through bad governance, taking undue advantage and capture of society, obviously it doesn't contribute to social cohesion. So ultimately it boils down to leadership, it boils down to good governance, it boils down to social, uh, civil society participating in the process. Now each country will have a different political system and, and I think we'll have to recognize that and I don't think we here or anywhere else for that matter should get into a prescription of what that political system should be. But no matter what, the whole process of the civil society being involved has to be at the core of people feeling part of this process and therefore contributing to social cohesion. In India, it is exacerbated, of course, by the whole issue of caste, and therefore some legal steps which have been taken have to come to help that process along. But as I said, you can have all the laws in the world, but if you don't have nay, it doesn't really help. Uh, I think it ties into the question that you raised. Uh, what does one do if there is poor governance and the leaders themselves are responsible for it? What does one do? Throw the leaders out, uh, if you can. But that's what happens in one form or another. Uh, and again, without going into the structure of a political system, uh, I think education, uh, and uh, empowerment. And I'll give you a specific example without naming the country and it is not a uh, democracy as generally known in the West. Uh, 1994, I went to that country to talk to the government and basically said it would be good to have the office of an Auditor General. And the Prime Minister said, what does an Auditor General do? Of course, I." downplayed the, the consequences of an auditor general on him somewhere in the future. <laughs> so I basically said, auditor general, just make sure that money is spent well. And he said, oh, that sounds a good idea. We gave a small technical assistance. To make a long story short, we created an office of the auditor general in this country. And two years later, there's an act in the legislature creating it. And the first auditor general was the prime minister's friend and a chemical engineer. I have nothing against chemical engineers. You know, I sort of an engineer myself, but chemical engineers, auditor general. But that was okay with me because that was Neeti. I mean, you know, for me, the important thing was an auditor general office was created. Five years later, again, to cut a long story short, we get a lot of training, all that. The same auditor general, chemical engineer by initial profession, friend of the prime minister, charged the prime minister with gross negligence and misdemeanor. Institutions make a difference, and all of us who have seen corruption and the endemic effects it has at first hand feel terribly helpless. I would say to you that you keep working at it. Have the institutions, civil society participation, even in countries which do not have a process 
as readily available as in others. And uh, I think uh, that's the only way to do it. Good governance is a precondition for good development, but don't go into it with rose-tinted glasses. Uh, how do we look at the cost of green growth? Uh, that's a very uh, detailed technical assessment done on, at a country level. Uh, we look at specific projects. We look at the cost of, for example, uh, if we were to put a coal-fired thermal plant, in some places there's no other choice. The choice is no electricity or a coal-fired thermal plant. It's not our first preference, but hydro is not possible, uh, wind is not possible, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. <laughs> then what we insist is what will be the cost of a supercritical technology? What will be the cost of the sophisticated technology with very high quality scrubbers? And those are the costs essentially that has to be borne. And then we find ways of either seeing if some international agency can bear the cost or find ways to make some resources available to these countries. But the devil is in the details. So we have to actually cost the consequences of green growth project by project, sector by sector, country by country. And, and the good thing is that it's being mapped now quite extensively in Asia. And again, as I said, we don't run into questions, why should we do it? It's a question of how can we afford it? How can we find it? Fiscal deficits are huge, so how do I manage and how do I prioritize? Which I think is a very welcome situation compared to even 10 years back when we almost had to argue why we had to have green uh, energy concepts into the project selection. Thanks, John. Ah. One, two, three, okay. Um, two here, and then at the back. Um, hi, thank you. I was just asking, how, how would Can you, you speak a bit louder? Sorry. Can you? Yeah. Um, what would you recommend um, from the research or from wisdom as to how to tackle how to get more education into India, for example, and including the cultural norms of how women should be studied. How to get more education? Yeah, how to effectively educate more people in India, especially India. in the rural ah. places. Right. Thank you. <coughs> Hello. Hi. Um, I was just wondering if I might be able to draw you out on on one particular country that I think ties into quite a lot of what you were talking about with regards to social values of Naya and Niti and the need for that kind of institutional framework and then that tying into a green economy. Um, and it seems that the role of the, the ADB in this country would be particularly pertinent, and that's Burma. Um, not just cognizant of what happened in 2008 and millions of people being displaced with Saika and Nargis, but current debates about um, reform that's going on in the country and reform to foreign direct investment laws and the government of that country looking to institutions like the ADB and the World Bank and the IMF for uh, maybe not prescription but at least <coughs> ad advice and as you say at a very broad level help. I was wondering if you might just be able to give us some thoughts on what kind of help <coughs> you think would be appropriate for the ADB to give a country like that mm. given the focus of your platform. Thank you very much for the opportunity to this question and thank you very much for the speech. Uh, I am Zia, uh, a risk management student at London School of Business and Finance. My question is, uh, to what extent do you think that's important uh, for international financial institutions and uh, let's say World Bank, European Bank for Reconstruction and Development and Asian Development Bank, to have a covenant for government projects, not private projects, for government projects like requiring publication, dealing with publication, like having such a covenant. Yeah, covenant required about governments. Sorry. The covenant about? Uh, covenant about having like uh, some um, <coughs> levels of population, uh, pollution, let's say, in, in, a, in the economy. Okay, if government approaches to you, says that, okay, we, want, we are asking you to finance this project, and you, you respond to them, say that, okay, go and deal with your pollution issues first, and then we will finance your project. To what extent that's r realizable? Mm -hmm. So this is for green growth here. <coughs> green growth, a covenant for. Uh, ensuring green growth. Yeah, can, can be We're not talking right. about governance here, is it? Um, like, what do you mean, government? Uh, government. When you not 
uh, uh, you're not talking about covenants regarding governance, but about green growth. No, I'm talking about covenants imposed on government projects. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So let me now take it in the <laughs> order in which they were raised. A quality of education in India, uh, I think it has to be done at two levels. I mean, there are many, but there are fundamentally two. One is we have for too long focused on the input side, uh, inputs like building schools. Uh, we've built schools and therefore we've thought we've provided education. We really haven't sort of gone into teachers training. We haven't looked at whether there are teachers in those schools or are there books in those schools or if students are not there, why aren't they there, etc. So I think we have to start looking at the quality aspects in India much more in the public sector. There, India spends about 3% of its GDP on education, which is awfully inadequate. So it has to spend more, but not just spend more, but look at much more on the quality side. And simultaneously, I think we should have no bars against the private sector getting involved in education. Uh, there has to be, I think, some standards ensured, because there are cases, many cases actually, where the private sector's education has promised things which they have not been able to deliver and never intended to. But other than assuring some minimum standards and to make sure there is no fraudulent uh, practices, private sector's involvement in education in India all the way through from the primary, secondary, tertiary, I think is extremely important. Uh, it's not going to be easy, but uh, I think uh, we have to focus on quality. India produces, as I'm sure you know, 250,000 engineers a year. Only a quarter of which, unfortunately, are employable by international standards. So in India, we don't really have, at least at the higher levels, problem of quantity, it's the quality issue. And that sort of, you know, that's the dilemma because you also have primary enrollment improving, but not enough. But even those who enroll, the dropout ratio is very high. So you've got to focus on the quality. On my mind, I'm very glad you asked that question. Um, Oops. That's right. Uh, because only yesterday we went to our board with what we call an interim strategy for Myanmar. Uh, I want to make two points. First, we are an apolitical institution, but our owners are very political. So the decision about Myanmar, whether we should be there, not be there, why weren't we there earlier, is taken by the members uh, and not by ADB. But having said that, point number two, I think at this stage, the most important thing in Myanmar is really to focus on the social uh, indicators. Because I think for almost 20 years, <coughs> almost a generation, the social indicators in Myanmar have really taken a huge dip, as you would imagine. Uh, schooling, health, uh, maternal mortality, all the social indicators that you think of, access to clean water, access to sanitation. I think the focus has to be on that. Uh, we ourselves cannot resume our operations in Myanmar till their so-called outstanding loans have been paid off, but that's a technical requirement. Once that is done, we will be there. So we will be focusing on the social indicators, and the other will be infrastructure. There has not been enough infrastructure growth uh, other than some very uh, sort of capital-intensive uh, infrastructure in the oil refining and oil exploration and some expressways. So there's a huge amount of infrastructure investments required as well, which institutions like us will be involved. But the principal focus must be to repair the social indicators which have taken a big hit. And on your question about the standards, about us imposing, that's already done. I mean, that is done in all projects that we do, all projects financed by ADB must meet certain best practices on environment, on relocation, on the consequences of the projects on the indigenous people. So we've got policies, not only us, all other international institutions that you have named, and this is part of the covenant. Uh, and if those are not complied, then of course, you know, we can and do suspend projects. The governance one is also there. I mean, there are standard governance there that our funds will be used in a certain way. There will be audited accounts, audited statements provided. Uh, uh, quarterly, uh, at the end of every year, we'll have audited financial statements. We have the right to go and 
look at the project accounts, which we do. But I should say that money is fungible. So our projects being sort of, you know, run very clean is not enough because our projects are usually just a small part of the large development expenditure of the country. So we therefore have to really focus on good governance in the country as a whole, not just on our projects, though that's a minimum and we do that. Very much for. So where are you? Ah. Oh yeah. Thank you very much for your talk tonight. Sorry, I can't I, see. Oh, oh sorry, sorry. Yeah. sorry. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, no. Gan Gandhi comes to mind in some ways, and how he was trying to focus on just ordinary people trying to work from the ground upwards in a very small way, but in a, in a way that sort of builds community. And I wonder whether. You know, you, you sort of live with those thoughts of Gandhi when you're working in the bank there and, and try to see whether his principles in some ways, which I think they're internationally recognised as, as great um, tracks of wisdom, if you like, um, could, could be used um, with perhaps very little money in, in a sense. Uh, hello, my name is Tong Zhao. I'm an economic student in LSC. Um, we know there is a lot of uh, international NGOs working on um, uh, developing in a uh, developing world. And um, how would you recommend the role of <coughs> NGOs in uh, these developing world? And also, um, do you um, like the um, the government? Uh, we have. Their, our own policy towards developing, and uh, is there any way that they can cooperate with those NGOs? Can you pass the mic to yes. Hello, thank you for your lecture, and I'm Takayoshi Kato. I'm studying here at the LSE. And uh, in order to achieve the green growth, you mentioned <coughs> that it is not um, constructed to talk about the ideological uh, discussion about like stock or flow or like per capita or uh, gross CO2 emission. So uh, what, but it's a fact that um, there's a growing difference in the perception between developed and developing countries. What kind of uh, role uh, can ADP plays in, t in terms of or to, to bridge the gap of the perception between developed right. and developing countries? Thank you. That, that's an excellent question about uh, Gandhian philosophy. And uh, do we aspire to that? Uh, yes, we do. Do we think about it in sort of, you know, day-to-day -day projects or advice? I have to be very honest, no. Uh, not because it's not relevant, but because I think if we're talking about the Gandhian philosophies in terms of governance, absolutely, I think that is. But in terms of the bottom up, which I think is very important, I think that has to be done by the countries themselves, the communities themselves. Our role uh, is at a larger level of large projects, large infrastructure, financing for which only we could provide. I don't see there is a contradiction between the two, or there shouldn't be. But I have to be honest with you that you know it doesn't sort of start with our looking at it exactly how it will be uh, at every project. Though, because there's involvement of civil society, the beneficiaries in all our projects, some of those aspects will come in. But at a philosophical level, yes. But at an actual practical level on a project by project, I'll have to say, no, it doesn't sort of enter into the discussion debates uh, you know, at, at each stage. Uh, that was a very good point about the INGOs. Uh, I think you, you raised it. You know, for a long time, and some countries even now, unfortunately, 
the NGOs, international or local, are somehow seen as troublemakers. Somehow, oh my God, to deal with, just to sort of, you know, get them off our back, or say something to them so that they'll go away and say everything is fine. Uh, it's changing, not quite perfect, but it's changing because I think the international NGOs, I'm talking about NGOs, international NGOs synonymously, civil society. I think they have a very, very important role to play. They have a very important role to play in accountability, in, in just making sure that the government's feet are held to fire. Our feet are held to fire. Uh, we have an accountability mechanism policy, which basically says we must uphold the policies we ourselves have put in place, say, on example, on good governance or safeguards, or environmental uh, considerations. So the international NGOs, particularly those who are on the ground, can give us information and feedback, bottoms up, which we won't have any time is with the question that you asked, sir. The international NGOs sometimes do have a political agenda. And I'm willing to accept that so long as it's clear. So, and sometimes those political agendas may or may not converge with those of the countries, and that's between the countries and the NGOs to sort out. But by and large, international NGOs Local NGOs play a very important part and are actually, we involve them in almost all projects in one form or another. Uh, because they are, as I said, they are our watchdogs, they are the ones who know things on the ground. We hear things from the government which sometimes sort of, you know, sort of rose tinted or slanted. So it's good to know what's actually happening. But they should be seen as partners in the development process, not as adversaries. Uh, and that is changing, but it's not quite there yet. The uh, role of ADB in this whole discussion about climate change uh, is a very interesting one. Uh, what I find I end up doing, the developed countries get very angry with me because you know, I'm not pushing China and India enough. And the developing countries, China and India, get very mad with us because what we're talking about is sort of saying, why aren't you pushing per capita? Don't you know what the West has done to us? Uh, per capita wise, you know, India is a fraction and ch even China is one fourth that of the US and India is about one tenth. So how can you tell us that we have to do our bit? So I always feel that maybe we're doing something right because we're basically irritating both sides to the same extent. But I think our role is exactly what I have said. I mean, just state the facts, uh, not take sides. I fully empathize with why developing countries feel aggrieved and they feel that been, this has been unfair. The West has essentially contributed to the stock and now after 200 years of industrialization, uh, basically what we're telling the developing world, you can't follow the model that we did in the past. On the other hand, I think it is totally counterproductive for the developing countries to have a growth path which I showed makes them much more vulnerable. And I think we just have to look at the future. I give the I make the point that if I'm a Bangladeshi citizen in 2100 and my house in Dhaka has flooded, it won't do much good if I tell my grandson that, look, I just want you to know that it's not my fault. It's the Western's fault and both he and I drown. So I think we just have to take a much more pragmatic view that this is one planet that we have to work on. And the role of ADB is to keep pushing this point. As a matter of fact, uh, together with LSE, uh, we are actually working on a very important study on green growth, which will be available soon, uh, which will make this point very, very uh, forcefully uh, that we all have to be in this together. On, uh, I'm going to abuse my position and ask one question here on um, integration. Um, I know both you and the ADB are heavily involved in working <coughs> on regional integration. Could you tell us a little bit more sure, about that? Sure. Uh, in Asia, uh, I told you the whole story about Asia. Uh, one phenomenon which uh, I think has become very important uh, since the uh, end of the uh, Vietnam War, which in Vietnam is called the American War, uh, is uh, the fact that conflict doesn't pay, cooperation does. 
Now, of course, one has been talking about regional cooperation, but really it was in the 1990s that the so-called greater Mekong sub-region, the, the countries which were basically at war during the Indochina period, came together and started building connectivity, uh, highways, economic corridors, greater trade, China, Myanmar, Thailand, Laos, Cambodia, Vietnam. And East Asia, of course, has been more integrated. Uh, and intra-regional trade in East Asia now is about 55% of their uh, total trade. Unfortunately, in South Asia, the regional integration is much less. But the agenda for regional cooperation uh, rather than regional integration, I think, is now much stronger. Uh, Asia recognizes that there is a benefit to coming together, but, and this is a very important point, that Asia does not believe in fortress Asia. So it's, it's what we call open regionalism. We basically will trade more amongst ourselves, but this is not the cost of somebody else. Uh, the recent economic crisis in the West has only driven home the point that there must be rebalancing of growth. Asia cannot just be a producer Asia, factory Asia, and export to US and Europe and to Japan. We have to be a consumer as well as a producer. But being a consumer means that we should be able to trade amongst ourselves. We also have to recognize that we are the largest saver. We save, we're very parsimonious, we save about 34% of our GDP. <coughs> and yet, we don't have the ability to intermediate financially, and our savings make their way either to Wall Street or to London, and then gets back to us again with the additional burdens of the costs and the exchange rate risks. So there's a lot of emphasis on financial integration in, in Asia. So financial integration, trade integration, economic integration, I think is certainly on the cards, much more now than it was before, much more in East Asia and Southeast Asia than in South Asia, but even there is beginning to happen. Uh, between India and Bangladesh, India and Sri Lanka, Nepal. India-Pakistan is obviously a major issue, but Central Asian integration is, uh, is moving ahead. But I don't think Asia will go the route of EU. There's just too much heterogeneity, uh, be it of language, be it of culture, be it of religion, for us to even think of an EU. And quite frankly, after the experience of EU, Maybe we should pause in any case. Uh, but uh, certainly much more regional cooperation, if not integration, uh, is, is, is certainly on the cards. Thank you. One more round I think we have time for. One, two, three. So the lady there, lady here, and the gentleman at the back. Uh, good evening. My name is uh, Annalise Vergara. I'm a student here at LSE. Uh, regarding the two um, parallel objectives that you have mentioned, if we look at the problem of greening the economy in the longer term, would this not imply that we need to um, set some limits to consumption? And if that is the case, uh, how can we <coughs> reconcile this objective with the objective of raising the quality of and living standards of, of the poor in Asia? Hi, I'm Yuan from LSE as well, and my question is really about ADB's involvement uh, in the inequality issue, especially um, if you can give us some case studies about like um, what kind of projects is, you think is the most effective in terms of reducing poverty, and what are the biggest obstacles that you face when you try to reduce inequalities among the countries? Thank you. Uh, thank you for your talk. My name is Feng from Sorry, I can't see you. Ah, there. Okay. Okay. Uh, my question is a uh, couple of questions. First of all, it's uh, about the integration you mentioned before. Actually, uh, uh, after the Asian financial crisis in the late, uh, the late 1990s, uh, the, the, the Asian economies, they tried to build up uh, Asian monetary fund, just uh, like, like, in, like similar with the uh, European monetary fund, international monetary fund, in order to coordinate uh, the, the, the economies in the Asia and uh, Particularly, the strong economies in the uh, East Asia to save them, to, to, to contribute to the fund and to save for the for the, in case of the, the financial crisis happens, they can compensate to the particular countries uh, you know, affected by the financial crisis. But the Chiang Mai is the, actually the Chiang Mai, the Chiang Mai initiative was not actually uh, realized. But it's, uh, it's, uh, so far, it's still uh, it's still uh, the blue. Point. 
for the many Asian economies. So what's your comment on that? And the second question is, uh, for many decades, Japan has um, been the only uh, I mean, the patron for the Asian Development Bank in terms of uh, the, the where the, the, the source, uh, financial source from. But with the changing of uh, the geo-economic landscape in the Asia Pacific region, do you expect the China and the India to, uh, to assume more responsibility to contribute to the fund of the Asian Development Bank? Thank you. That's a very, very fundamental challenge I think Asia is facing. I think uh, if Asians were to consume what say, the Americans are, there just won't be enough steel, there won't be enough oil, there won't be enough food uh, in the world. So I think uh, the consumption quality of life in conundrum is a real one. But I think where the debate gets very sensitive is when the West basically says, you must curtail consumption, uh, and therefore, you know, shouldn't have a car, for example. Now, for somebody who doesn't even have a bicycle, to say you shouldn't have a car from people who have got three cars in their garage, which can actually house five, somehow just doesn't sound right or fair. So I think one of the issues in this whole debate is the concept of fairness. Uh, is it right that the per capita consumption on every index is so much higher uh, in the West and so much lower on a per capita basis in, the, in, the, in Asia? Having said that, in Asia, I think we recognize that we have to manage our consumption levels much better uh, than has been possible in the West. Therefore, not three cars, but maybe one, and not maybe a Hum, what's it called, Hummer, Humvee, or whatever it's called. Uh, not that, but a much more efficient nano maybe, or much more fuel efficient. So focus on efficiency of usage of resources, uh, energy efficiency, uh, much more concentrated, much more emphasis on public transportation. So I think that's a very important point. We cannot be on the same linear path as the West. But the consumption has to grow. Uh, I have had many occasions of debating exactly this when basically the idea has been, if only Asia would not consume as much. And I think we have to recognize that their consumption levels still are fraction, a very small fraction of that in the US. So they will increase, but hopefully not as much, and cannot be by as much. But that's a, that's a major conundrum. And I think we are well advised to make sure we don't sort of go on a uh, consumption path, which is obviously unsustainable. Uh, your question about what are we doing about inequality? Uh, I think basically some of the points that I mentioned, uh, you know, uh, are part of our policy dialogue with the governments. I think the debate gets clouded because whenever people, whenever we talk about reducing inequality, somehow people think we're talking about redistribution. And we're not talking about redistribution. That's why the three pillars that I mentioned about increasing inclusiveness, the first one was to make sure there is high growth, sustainable high growth. We are talking about increasing the size of the pie. But we also are saying that you cannot depend on a trickle down theory. And you cannot depend on the maxim that a rising tide lifts all boats, because it's a fact that some boats have holes in their hull and people are ill-equipped sometimes to handle illness or you know, uh, illiteracy, and you have to help them, or you need social safety nets. It's a combination. It's extremely complex. Growth by itself is much easier. Grow and then everything else will follow. When you talk about inclusive growth, you've got to bring all of that into the, uh, into the equation. And there's local political processes. The elite are the beneficiaries of growth, and they are the ones who have to maybe give up something to make it more inclusive. But my po our point is, if you don't, there'll be so much possibility of so much social trauma that maybe the whole growth story will come unstuck. Having a huge house and a gated community is not the most sort of safest way of making sure that you have that house forever. Uh, 
your question about the Asian Monetary Fund and the post-97 financial crisis, I think one lesson that Asia came out of that was that you can't depend on anybody else but yourself in a crisis. Because in the Asian financial crisis, we found ourselves with very low reserves and found ourselves at the mercy of others uh, and other institutions outside the nation. So one of them was to talk about an Asian monetary fund. Uh, we'll sort of you know, pool our own reserves and own resources. It really was not possible to achieve that. I don't think it would be appropriate to have an Asian monetary fund outside the context of some international uh, cooperation such as the IMF. But two things happened. One, Asia went on a huge process of increasing its reserves, and of course you know the story. China's reserve, three trillion, India's in hundreds of billions, rest of Asia uh, equally good. But the, though the Chiang Mai initiative didn't quite take off the way you are mentioning, though it has now been tripled. The, the capital base of Chiang Mai Initiative is now tripled. There is something called the ABMI, the Asian Bond Market Initiative. The idea being that you develop a financial architecture so that you can intermediate the savings within Asia. As I was saying, one of the problems in Asia is that we save in Asia, we intermediate in uh, London or New York, and then get it back to Asia for investments. If we have an Asian bond market, you have Asian capital market, that, in, that savings can be intermediated much more efficiently. So though we do not have the Asian Monetary Fund, there are now much more institutional arrangements, including a very recently uh, established, you must have heard this, Asian Monetary Research Organization, AMRO, based in Singapore, which some say could be the nucleus of a future AMF, but that's sort of far into the future. More important thing to recognize is Asia is basically saying we will take care of ourselves in terms of having adequate reserves in case there is any crisis. And that is how we have worked at it. Uh, we certainly welcome very, very significantly increased contributions from China and India anytime. <laughs> Happy to take support from everybody. Unless anyone has a very burning question. I think we have come to the end of, anybody? Okay, last question. Wait, wait. Make sure it's an easy one, okay? <laughs> I don't know. Let's oh, see. Oh, okay. My name is, uh, is Alessandro, I'm a professional in the human resources sector. Uh, I would like to ask you a question about inequality. Right. Uh, because of the economic crisis, more and more uh, European people think of living in an in equal society. What do you think about this perception in comparison with the inequality you mentioned in your, in your speech? Thank you. Excepting for Latin America, inequality is increasing everywhere. Uh, Latin America used to uh, have large inequality. In absolute terms, the inequality in Latin America is still higher than in Asia. But that's the only region where it's actually declining. And it's declining because they have essentially been following the policies that I mentioned. Uh, yes, inequality in Europe is certainly of concern. Uh, but I have to say that those of us who come from Asia and we look at the European living standards and the way things are here, uh, we do sort of you know, think that your problems are not easy, but certainly nowhere as difficult as we face. And you guys should be just able to sort it out. So get on with it. Get on with it because it makes a big difference to us because we are affected by what happens in Europe because we are very coupled. And one of the reasons I think China is now not showing 10% growth rates and India is not showing the 7 8% growth rates is because of the economic uh, situation in Europe. And if only you guys would get your job done, you know, we would be better off. And my concern is to make sure that Asia is better off. But we also want to make sure that you are well as well. <laughs> On that note, we have to close and thank you all for um, generating a lively discussion. Thank you to our speaker, Mr. Nam. Thank you very much for an interesting discussion, as well as to the ADB for its support for this lecture. Thank you.